Can food lead bears out of trouble? We know food can lead bears into trouble. In campgrounds, a fed bear can be a dead bear. That's where the saying came from. But we're going to present two long-term case studies where food led bears out of trouble. It worked as a non-lethal tool. And during the decades we studied it, the data gave us a very different perspective on feeding, habituation, and food conditioning. It all boils down to what bears eat and what they do depend on their alternatives. They prefer a short list of digestible, nutritious wild foods. When those foods are scarce, they have to turn to lower quality foods, including people's food. In northeastern Minnesota, preferred foods in spring are new leaves and ant brood. In July and August, the main time of fattening there add berries and hazelnuts. After that, food disappears and bears in that region are genetically programmed to enter dens in September and October. Northeastern Minnesota differs from the rest of Minnesota. The growing season is shorter and the soil is shallower and less fertile. With a shallow soil, it doesn't take much drought to dry up the berries. Between drought, insect outbreaks, and temperature variations, food differs from year to year. When preferred wild foods are very abundant, as happens only occasionally, few bears are even seen. They prefer the wild foods. When wild food is only moderately abundant, Bears may be attracted to people's food, but will move on if people remove the attractants. In years when wild foods are very scarce, like during multi-year droughts in western states and sometimes in other habitats, including northeastern Minnesota, reducing attractants means the only food left is inside, which means break-ins. And aversive conditioning in those years just makes bears more sneaky. Here a bear ignored garbage to tear into insulation that gives off formic acid and smells like an ant colony, one of their favorite foods. Problems can also be bad in campgrounds. This U.S. Forest Service campground and a string of residences that stretched out six kilometers along a river were notorious for bear problems back in the early 1980s. During 1981 to 1983, officials had to remove six bears from the area for scattering garbage, damaging property, and approaching people. Some people thought bears were learning to like people's food at the campground, becoming habituated there, and then looking for easy meals of the same food at homes along the river. But that line of thought does not consider how scarce food is in the woods and what the bears' alternatives might or might not be. U.S. Forest Service officials hypothesize that the problem is not bears learning to eat people's food, not habituation and food conditioning, but simply hunger in years of poor natural food. They explored a non-lethal method to alleviate problems. In 1984, they began an eight-year diversionary feeding experiment. They began placing beef fat a quarter mile from the campground. They used beef fat because it's less preferred than the preferred wild foods, but more preferred than most human food. It worked. No nuisance problems developed that year in the campground or along the entire six kilometer long problem area without reducing attractants. In the second year of the eight year experiment, 1985, diversionary feeding was severely tested. Bear foods statewide hit a record low that still stands. Very little in the woods was nutritious and digestible. That drove nuisance problems to a record high that also still stands. In northeastern Minnesota, bears flocked to residences where they were wrongly labeled as habituated and food conditioned. Bears that were simply hungry were killed by the hundreds. 90 were killed in Duluth alone. In late summer that year, hunters began baiting as usual, but bears went to the bait piles in unusual numbers, and hunter success nearly tripled. Nearby, a long-term bear study, separate from the feeding study, 
showed us the problems bears were facing. Six of ten cubs being studied that year starved. Six of seven yearlings died. Adults were losing weight and aborting pregnancies. In their search for food, the bears were traveling farther than ever and experiencing the highest human cause mortality of that entire 23-year study. The 90 bears killed in Duluth included three old study bears that had previously spent their lives 90 to 107 kilometers away in roadless wilderness. But through it all, the diversionary feeding area remained trouble-free. Two mothers with cubs and ten other habituated and food-conditioned bears that visited the feeding site 278 times, ate 313 kilograms of beef fat, and stayed out of trouble. During the eight years of the experiment, officials saw an 88% reduction in removals compared with the previous three years. The only bears removed were two newcomers that hadn't yet found the diversionary feeding site. During the bad food year of 1985, we heard of two other trouble-free areas. One was a 10-mile radius around the huge Grand Marais dump, which was also a tourist attraction where bears and people mingled. The bears had food and didn't become nuisances at residences. The only complaint from the 10-mile radius was about a bear sleeping in someone's yard. The second area was a rural community of nearly 500 residents where a dozen homeowners had hand-fed bears for at least 24 years. We investigated further. The feeding had begun as diversionary feeding and eventually became recreational feeding that served the same purpose. Residents had learned what black bears are like directly from the bears. They saw for themselves that black bears are not the ferocious animals portrayed by the media. The bears changed people's attitudes. It takes two things to make a complaint, what a bear does and how the person feels about it. Seeing a bear was no longer a reason to get the gun or file a complaint in that community. With reliable feeding stations in the community, there were no bad food years and few problems. The community wanted to coexist with the bears. Ten years of records kept by the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources from 1996 to 2005 showed only two bear complaints from the community. That's 80% lower than the statewide average. The two complaints, both from the same person, were for a bear at a bird feeder and for a sub-adult looking in a window. No attacks, no break-ins, no aggression. If those problems had existed, Residents would not have fed bears and coexisted with them now for 50 years. Where people didn't want to see bears, reducing attractants was extra effective because the bears had other places to eat. As researchers, we wondered how the bears were affected and began a study that continues today. We found that some of the resident bears were so trusting that we safely radio collared them without using tranquilizers. The bears had not become increasingly aggressive in their quest for people's food. They became more trusting. This trust, which is generally called habituation and food conditioning, was fairly specific to locations, situations, and individual people. Bears that trusted people at feeding sites avoided them out in the woods. Residents knew that, and they hiked and picked berries without fear. Avoiding people away from feeding stations also held for a dispersing young male as he traveled 396 kilometers, that's 246 miles, in a year, circumventing the communities and residences along his way. Bears varied, and a few bears learned to recognize our voices and let researchers join them anywhere. They basically ignored us. They showed us how they spent most of their time working hard for a variety of wild foods as the latest studies of bear nutrition would predict. Diversionary feeding did not change the bear's wild food preferences. No bear became lazy and dependent. Many went months or years between visits to feeding sites. They did not try to obtain the largest number of calories for the least expenditure of energy.
the energetically pursued wild agendas. Females maintained their normal territories. This nine-year-old female had access to ten feeding stations but spent most of her time foraging for wild foods, living a full wild life, and avoiding people. In the eight years we have monitored her, she has never visited the big public campground in her area. We found the local bear population to be similar to the overall population, about one bear per four square kilometers. These fed bears were not dead bears. Cubs had 87% survival, and adults included some of the oldest bears in the population at 24 and 26 years of age. In these two long-term case studies, diversionary feeding was a non-lethal tool that reduced human-bear conflict 80 to 88 percent, even where bears were habituated and food conditioned. It's possible diversionary feeding could be even more effective without human contact.